with a new song, but I don't want that to hinder your worship, so don't worry too much about the lyrics, but posture your heart before the Lord to worship and adore Him. This morning we want to speak faith into the room. I don't know what you've been dealing with or facing. I know there are times where things are great in my life and there are times where, you know, things are a little chaotic and sometimes it's so easy to forget who God is, to forget his character, to forget what he's done in the past. And sometimes we think in that moment or we feel in that moment that he isn't gonna do what he said he's gonna do because we forget what he's done in the past, right? Or is that just me? I'm human, I, you know. Um, so this morning, I just wanna grab a hold of that. Um, I felt it very strongly in my heart this morning. Maybe it's just for me, I don't know. But maybe there are other people in the room that God wants us to remember his faithfulness. God wants us to remember his goodness. God wants us to remember that he has not forsaken us that he's never left us alone. And so this morning, Father, we come with open hearts. We reflect on your faithfulness and your goodness. God, because there's nothing that you can't do. There's nothing that is impossible. So this morning, we posture our hearts in that space. Father, come have your way. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. With just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch. My eyes were open to see, my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that he can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. Let's sing that out. There's nothing that There's 
no heart too hard. There's no far place we can run, God. God, your hand stretches. You reach us where we're at, God. There's no mountain too difficult to move. There's no situation that's too difficult to respond to. You are God, you are sovereign, you are holy, and you are worthy. And this morning we take a posture of faith. We take a posture of faith. We begin to speak to those mountains. We begin to speak to those situations because the God of all heaven, the God of all heaven, the God of all heaven and earth, he reigns, he rules, and he lives within us. So this morning we say that we believe, we believe, we believe that you're a man of your word. We believe that you're a man who speaks and moves. God, we thank you. We honor you, Father. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. So let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. And I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. And let faith arise. Let all agree, there's no power like the power of Jesus. And I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like His power. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that darkness my 
if there are moments that we're having a hard time remembering father I pray that you would bring it back to memory right now those times when we've been alone struggling facing hard times but in those moments where we've seen your goodness and your faithfulness God you have not left us alone you are Emmanuel God with us you are always with us father and so this morning we're not singing this in a place of despair but we're singing it from a place of rejoicing God that no matter what goes on no matter what we face no matter what path we are on father you are there with us because we are your children we are your sons and your daughters so God, even now, forgive us for the times that we've forgotten who you are, that we've forgotten your mighty hand, that we've forgotten your power, the power that lies in the name of Jesus. If you have nothing else to say this morning, speak the name of Jesus. It's all you'll ever need. There is all power. He is all knowing. He is all sovereign. Father, I pray for the ministry of your Holy Spirit through this room God to work in our hearts God to remind us God 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 you have not left your children alone God you have never seen the righteous forsaken or begging for bread God you provide so we sing this out in faith I know this may not be what we're used to but there's a place to grow here for all of us whether you are just feeding on the milk of his word or you're eating the meat of his word there is room for us to grow and to fully understand who he is every day he reveals his character every day he feeds us he is our daily bread so we're going to sing that again whether you've been a place where you have been dry 
and you need the living waters of the Holy Spirit to come and refresh you, if you just want more of Him, there's no separation here. God knows how to work and do what He needs to do in all of us. He knows where we're at. He knows what we need. He knows what our marriages need. He knows what, our, what we need in our jobs. He knows what we need in our finances. He knows it all. It doesn't surprise Him. But He delights in His people when we worship. He delights when we come and we test Him in that. So, Father, we sing this this morning in faith. Your way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper.
Yes, Jesus. We declare that truth. God, that great is your faithfulness towards us. How many times, God, we have strayed away, but your faithfulness endures forever. Father, the amount of times that you have pulled us back, that you have welcomed us when we shouldn't have been welcomed, God, your faithfulness is beyond belief. Lord, we stand in awe together that we serve a God who is so faithful that only through that faithfulness do all of us stand here. Lord, to sing praise with joy in our hearts, with peace in our minds because of your faithfulness towards us. Undeserving God. Many times ungrateful. But Lord, we recognize that you through it all are always faithful. We serve a great God. And we honor you and we worship you and we praise your holy and magnificent name this morning. In Jesus' name we say amen and amen and amen. Can you give God praise? Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, great is his faithful. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Good to see you all today. Why don't you turn and say hello to somebody before you're seated? Good morning, everybody. It is good to see you. Welcome to Zion. Always a wonderful time when we can get together on Sunday morning. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Justin. I'm the pastor here. Uh, and just always glad to be in the house of the Lord. Man, uh, even though this isn't the houses like they had back then. Uh, and we only meet here for a few hours every Sunday. It's good to gather with the saints. Uh, and I always say it, but it's true, I won't take it for granted every time that we can actually get together uh, on a Sunday because uh, so many times that has been ripped away from us and we haven't been able to gather uh, in person and physically. And so it is good to do that. Uh, we are going through a new series in Habakkuk and we started last week, so if you missed it last week, make sure you jump online, you listen to it. Uh, this is an incredible series. It's a small book in the Old Testament, but it is a powerful one. It is one quoted over and over again in the New Testament. Uh, there is a lot to say as we go through it, and it's, and it's gonna be exciting uh, to go through it because it's walking with God through tough times, uh, which I think all of us can say that if we're walking and it's with God, then we've been doing it through tough times. And so this is a way that we can learn from and glean from and do it with Habakkuk uh, together as we go through it. Uh, and so if you are new here, welcome. Later on, we'll talk about what we have for you, but I just wanted to say hello and welcome. I'm probably going to be in the family room for the rest of the service dealing with four little rascals. Um, but today uh, we have... Uh, Melvin, who's going to be bringing the word, so why don't we welcome Melvin. Can you all just join me in praying for Mel? Father, we thank you for what you want to bring today. We thank you for allowing us to enter into worship. Uh, Lord, and we just pray that you would just use our brother to speak to us today what you have from your word that your spirit would be upon him and upon us to receive and to hear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. As Justin said, last week we began a series in the book of Habakkuk, um, and we see a prophet who gets straight to the point. I love that. He doesn't introduce himself. He doesn't tell us the time period that he's in. 
He doesn't even tell us his father's name as many of the prophets do. He just jumps right in into sharing his burden, a.k.a. complaining to God. Habakkuk was furious because at that time, God's people, Judah, were not quite acting like God's people. Uh, there was injustice. There were a lot of different things going on. When justice did go forth, it was perverted. And Habakkuk has been crying, crying, crying over and over to God. And he feels like God is silent. This week, we jump into part two. And what happens is God jumps in, similar to when Kanye interrupted Taylor Swift in the 2009 VMAs, and he says, Habakkuk, I'm going to let you finish. But he just cuts him right off, and he gives us his response. And I'd love to read for that, read that today. It's, it's an answer that it really is unbelievable. But, so you're going to pick up with me in Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. And that is also in your sheets. Um, so you can read along with me. Can y'all can stand real quick? Uh, stand as we read God's word. Thank you. Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. Look among the nations and see, wonder, and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards. More fierce than the evening wolves, their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence. All their faces forward, they gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. You can be seated. I want to pray for us. Father, we thank you. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you are working. God, and that you are trustworthy. And that even when we don't understand or we may disagree, that God, we can trust that your ways are far better than ours and that they're good. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And so the first thing that we see in this passage is that God is working in unbelievable ways. Unbelievable ways. Usually you hear that and you think, yeah, amen, hallelujah. But we may not like it. He's working in unbelievable ways, but we may not like it. Look at verse 5. He says that he is, look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. So God doesn't respond. He doesn't answer to Habakkuk as one might expect. He doesn't just resolve the issue that Habakkuk was bringing up, but rather he redirects it a little bit. And, and what he says is he's going to judge the wickedness of Judah by an even more wicked nation, the Chaldeans, a.k.a. Babylon. The Chaldeans were, this is, this is wild, right? Uh, um, this, if you're like the prophet Habakkuk, which you're going to see next week, your response to this is like, what? What's, what, what are you doing, God? Like, what, what's going on here? Why would God address the wickedness of one nation with a nation that is more wicked? And, and this is shocking. This would be like me saying, hey, you've been wilding out for a while. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send someone in who has been wilding out on steroids to, to, to teach you a lesson. That's essentially what is going on here. It's really jarring, and it is something that is unbelievable, but unbelievable not in necessarily a good sense, right? It's unbelievable because it's shocking that God would do something like that. And my question for us today is how would you feel? How do you feel when God brings suffering into your life? 
How do you feel when you are crying out for help and God doesn't ex answer your cry as you expected? Honestly, this is something that I'm wrestling with. Present tense, like right here, right now. I haven't figured this out. I'm not coming up here because I'm an expert at it. I'm, I'm dealing with this similar to many of you. See, I have worked through a lot of loss and pain. I probably preached more funerals than I've preached up here as I am. And most of them were for family members. I grew up very poor, surrounded by a lot of violence. And the one woman that I had who was like a mother to me passed away when I was just 11 years old. Fast forward, as a Christian, I've, I've suffered. I would go to Bible college because I felt like God called me into full-time vocational ministry. He called me to preach and do some things, and I wanted to be prepared and present myself as a man who, who was approved, handling the, right of, the word of God rightly. And, and I would literally leave my job and take my family, which was my wife and I at the time, go to a Bible college, study the word of God, and come back to have no job, which is part of my irresponsibility, to be honest. All right, similar to Judah in this passage. But to come back, have no job, and then to struggle to find a job, and then to struggle to find an apartment and bouncing around people's homes while doing that for almost a year. Then when we finally get a, an apartment, and I'm not talking about something glorious. I'm talking about, like, we snuck in through the back door, and it was, like, slumlord. Uh, uh, you know, the place was just, it was not that healthy of a place to be in. When we finally do, we hear news that a family member that's close to us is sick with cancer. I've wrestled with pain and loss. I've wrestled with unexpected answers. Most recently, I led a prayer movement that, that had 30 to 60 people on average nightly for about six weeks praying. People that would, I would never have imagined had, would pray in their lives. And they were praying and talking to God as if they were OGs in the faith. And we were praying for one thing. We were praying that my uncle would be healed. And after that six weeks was up, my uncle, 43 years old, healthy man, would die from COVID. I've wrestled with the unexpected answer. God doing unbelievable things, but way in ways that we do not expect. But here's the thing that we can trust on, that we can learn from this passage is a few things about God's character. God's character is trustworthy. God is good. The first thing I want you to see about God's character is this, that God sees, all right? We just read verse five, and God says, look, wonder, be see, be astounded. He uses four words to kind of get them to be alert and aware. But he's saying this because he's saying, look, I see it. I'm seeing it among the nations. I'm seeing it all around you. You look. Last week, and this is so funny, Habakkuk was complaining to God, and that's, so, that's great and good. I want, you to, I want to encourage you to do that. But what God does here is he kind of flips com Habakkuk's complaint on his head. And Habakkuk, in, in, in verses 2 through 4, right, as he's complaining to God, he says, look and observe, in, ver in verse 3. Right? He says, why do you see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? And God says, look and see and wonder and be astonished. God is doing a holy clapback right here, right? It's like when you're close to somebody and y'all just go at it, but y'all not fighting. Y'all just kind of like, you know, dealing with some stuff. That's the type of relationship God and Habakkuk have here. Habakkuk says in verse 4 that the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. And so justice goes forth perverted. And in this week, God says in verse 7 that their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. In other words, God is going to use the Chaldeans who carry out wicked justice. He's going to use that to carry out his good justice. Habakkuk cries out in verse 2 and 3, or how long will you not hear my cry? Violence, and you will not save, right? And, and God says this week in verse 9, he says, they all come for violence, speaking of the Chaldeans coming to judge Judah. God sees intimately. God knows this nation that he's raising up. He knows their tactics. He knows their strengths, their morals, or really lack thereof. And he knows their gods. 
He says that justice proceeds from themselves. He says that they scoff at kings. In verse 11, he says that whose might is their God. God sees. He sees this nation. And God is aware that Judah needs to be checked. He's aware of that. He knows that they're acting up, and he knows that nothing is going to change unless he does something about it. And Habakkuk is thinking God is idle, but Habakkuk is, God is saying, I'm working, and you're not going to believe it. See, God sees what you're going through. He sees what I'm going through. You are not making God aware. God was not surprised when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit. He knew. He saw. He wasn't looking for Adam. Where are you? He knew where Adam was, but he wanted them to come to him. And similarly, God sees our pain and what is happening in the world. The other thing that we see in this passage is that God is sovereign. God is working, but we may not like it. God sees he is sovereign. He's not passively allowing things to happen. Look at verse 6. It says that, behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans are, are, are little people at this point. The highest, like, the, 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 the top dog would have been Assyria. But God is raising them up. And slowly but surely, they're taking over different places. And God is, gonna, God is eventually going to give Judah into their hands. And God says, I'm raising up the Chaldeans. See, they can't raise up without God's doing. They can't overtake Judah without God's permission. There's some things in your life that you're like, nah, this is not of God. And God is allowing that to happen. God is doing something in it. I know in, in tough times, it can seem like God is absent or like God is just passively standing by watching while we get beaten up. But what if we would change our perspective? What if we saw the tough time as a tool to deepen our trust? What would happen if you saw the tough times that you're going through as a tool to deepen your trust in God? What if we took a moment to recognize that God is in control and maybe, just maybe, he's working this out for our good and his glory. See, sometimes, church, we get this backwards. Instead of God being sovereign, we think we're in control. We think this is a mess. Da, 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 da. Instead of going to God, what we do is we try to take on that thing and t- control it ourselves. Our might and our wisdom become our strength. Our justice, a.k.a. what is right, goes forth from ourselves, similar to the Chaldeans. See, isn't that what we do as a society when we say, my truth is my, is, is my truth, right? Like, that, that's my truth. Or when we make our desire our identity, and then if you challenge our desire, you're challenging the very person that we are. We can scoff at authority and even God, forgetting Who is Lord? Forgetting that God is Lord and we are better off following him than doing our own thing. See, this is, it's like a a parent, right? Um, And this happens all the time where a kid wants to do something. They want to do that thing, but you just, the parent is like, no, because in their foresight, they they maybe have a little bit more wisdom and understanding to see that that thing is going to happen. That that thing is going to go wrong. You know, I tell my son sometimes, like, hey, listen, sit down when you're drinking your drink because it's going to spill. And sure enough, just now in church, he spilled some orange juice while he was walking around. If that's the case between a parent and a child, how much more between us and God? We think we know what's better for our lives. Here's, here, here's what it can look like, right? So... When we talk about God is sovereign and we trust in God's sovereignty, what does that mean? It means trusting in him with your time, your talent, and your treasure. Giving him the first fruits of all of those things. So your time. God has given that time to you anyways. The reason why you're here breathing is because God has given you breath. 
And so what would it look like for you to take that time and use it for his glory? That instead of maybe I'm just going to do, and I'm not saying Netflix is evil, because, you know, y'all could watch a show or something every now and then, but I'm going to just binge right now. What would it look like to spend some time with God? To commune with him, to be with him. Or maybe to give your time to serving somebody around you. You know, you, 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 you just want to go home and somebody says something and you're like, oh, God, that's going to start up a convo and a half. And I have some words to say as a believer, but I don't got time for this. Maybe you want to take that moment to pause and speak to them. What about your gifts? God has given you abilities and things, not just so that we can floss and, and look good, but so that we can leverage them for the kingdom, so that we can shift culture, so that we can put God on display, and so that we can serve him through those gifts. What would it look like to transform your workplace by using your skills for the glory of God? How would, how would the way that you work change if your ethics right, influence those talents? Now you can't use those talents for whatever you want. Now you can't just exploit people, but you are acknowledging that God is sovereign over them. And then your treasures, your finances, right? You know, some people say you give to God. I like to say we keep. Because God's given you everything. He's given you all, all of the finances that you have. And so what does it mean then to give the first fruits of some of those things that he has given you? Just, here you go. I'm going to keep the rest. See, and so God is working, but you might not like how it looks. He sees, and he is sovereign, but he's also trustworthy. And this is what I want to tell you guys, that you can trust God even when you disagree with him. You may be thinking at this point, if God sees and God is sovereign then why would he allow terrible things to happen? Because on one side, if someone is, if they see things and they're aware of it and they're em empathetic towards it, right, like they can see that thing and they care, but they don't have power, you give them a pass. You're like, I know you, but you can't do nothing about this. I know you care, but you can't do nothing about this. But on the other side, if somebody's sovereign, but they don't really see, they don't really care, you don't give them a pass, but you don't expect anything better of them. You're just a jerk. You, could, you got power to do something about this, but you just don't care. But God is not one or the other. God is, he both sees and cares, and he is sovereign. So if he can do something about it, and he cares about what, what I'm going through, why doesn't he? Why doesn't he? And there are many reasons why maybe God is refining his people Maybe God wants to, you know, weed out some of those things in your life that you have been worshiping instead of him. Maybe uh, uh, there, there, it's, a, it's, it's a discipline, right? Maybe you've been wilding out and you need to be checked, like Judah in this passage. But why do it this way? Why let a, 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 wicked, a more wicked nation take over God's people? And the reality is, and this isn't a cop-out, the reality is, is that we don't know. We don't know why God does things the way he does them. I cannot tell you why he took my uncle after those weeks of prayer. I can't tell you why your family member wasn't healed. I can't tell you why you had to go through a pandemic and experience loss, not just of people, but of rhythms in your life. I can't tell you why that situation was so rough or why that person did that thing to you. And if I pretended to know those things, I'd be claiming to know the mind of God. And while I know a few things about God, I don't know the breadth and depth of his, of, of his mind. We don't get those answers in this text today. God does not remove Habakkuk's complaints, but he does affirm a divine order in creation, even if it's hidden to Habakkuk and even if it's hidden to us. What I can tell you is that God is trustworthy. He is good and he is in control. He does see and he is sovereign. And although we may not understand, we can confidently trust 
when things don't go our way. And I gave you guys the analogy of parents before, but it's the same way, that, that schism, that chasm. Uh, the difference between a child and a parent, it's even greater between God and us. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's thoughts are higher and greater than ours. Romans 8.28 tells us another truth that we can hang on to. And it's that, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. See, the truth is, the truth is, church, that God can use even the most heinous thing for good. God can use even the most terrible things that happen in this world. God can use the fallenness of this world and its structures, right, and and the mess that we've created, and he can still orchestrate it out for his good. In fact, you know how I know this most? Around 2,000 years ago, around 2,000 years ago, he did just that when he sent his son into the world. Born in a manger, growing up in the hood of Nazareth, Because as Nathaniel would say, nothing good comes from Nazareth. And if you go to Nazareth today, it has not been gentrified. It is still rough. It is still rough. He was tempted in every way, yet without sin. Burdened with such deep angst that he would sweat blood. And yet, he'd go through the suffering, as Hebrews puts it, for the joy set before him, he looked at the cross. He would die, and he would experience resurrection. He would experience the full judgment of God for people like you and me and resurrect to show us the power of God over sin and death and suffering and offer us salvation. Here's the thing. God not only sees... God is not only sovereign, but God saves. God saves. He uses things like the very death of Jesus to offer the salvation of the world. But it isn't going to happen on our terms. When God saves, he does it in a far greater way. And thank God that it doesn't happen on our terms, right? Because you and I, we, we, we mess things up. You know, you ever, like, you, you're buttoning up your shirt and you miss that first one and it's, like, all, like, tangled up and messed up? Like, if you can't even button your shirt right, how are you going to control society? How are you going to do what's best for your life? Only God can. God sees all things from all perspectives, knowing intimately our struggles and the things going on. And he is the one that can do something about it and even does so within a broken world. He is the one who saves in the midst of suffering, and so we can trust him even when we disagree on his methods. In closing, here's what I want to tell you. God is working in unbelievable ways, but you may not like it. He sees what is happening and is sovereign over all of it. He is involved in it all, even the most heinous of things. But he's not only... Seeing it, he is aware, he's not only aware, he's in control. And he does things that we may not like, but we can trust them. Uh, We can trust him that he is working for our good and his purposes. To my believers, I want to ask you a few questions, all right? Here are the questions I want to ask you. When God does something you disagree with, how do you respond? Because that's the thing about tough times, right? When you're trusting God in tough times, there are times that we can examine ourselves, where we can see what we really believe. When God does something you don't agree with, how do you respond? What would it look like for you to trust God in your difficult season? Maybe that's right now. 
Maybe, you, you know, money's lean and you need to trust God to provide and for you to be generous. Maybe your time, right? You're doing all of these different things. They're all good things, but are they all things that God has called you to? Your talents, your, are, are you leveraging those things for the kingdom or are they just things that you hoard for yourself? And then reflect on how you relate to God. Do you see him as Lord who is sovereign and good? Or might you be molding him to your will? Because a God who does something that we never disagree with is just us, is, is just us creating God in our own image. To my friends who would not call themselves followers of Jesus, I want to leave you with this. In Acts chapter 13, verse 41, Paul, the apostle, says something based on Habakkuk chapter, uh, 1, verse 5. And he says, look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. See, Paul uses Habakkuk to refer to the work that God did through Jesus, that he was going to save people, the world. He was going to open up salvation, not just to his people, but to everyone, so that everyone could be part of his community. And he says, Jesus offers redemption and forgiveness through his life, death, and resurrection. But if you do not believe, you will perish in the coming judgment of God. Similar to the people of Judah then, because they were unbelievers at heart, who remain unconvinced about God and his purposes. So I implore you today to put your confidence in Jesus. Not in yourself, not in the things of this world that fade, but in Jesus and in him alone. God is trustworthy. He sees, he's sovereign, and he saves. Father, thank you so much for your word. This is a tough one, God. But I pray that we would deal with the things that are in it. I pray that we would trust you in the moments when, that are tough, when you don't answer us the way that we expect. And that, God, that we would lean further into you in those times because where else are we going to go, God? You have the words of eternal life. And so we trust you, we love you, and we pray that you would use this word for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
one more time Christ Lord, help us fall into your hands every day. But that right now, Lord, that we would give ourselves over to you wholly and fully. Lord, as you call us in your word to take up our cross daily, that this is a, a regular thing that we are called to do, to put our trust, our hope in you. Lord, to trust that you are at work even if we can't see it. Lord, and that your work, what you do is often amazing, awesome, powerful. Help us be a people that trust in your name and in your name alone. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Y'all may be seated. <clears throat> 